Luke chapter 15, we've already looked at the first uh, two parables as the Lord is addressing the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. They come together and uh, it seems that they were following, draw, drawing near unto him is what the first verse says. They drew near unto him, all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees were perplexed that Jesus was receiving sinners and uh, he, that's even their expression. He said, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them, and began to blow their mind, and here Jesus addresses their concerns. How in the world can the Son of God eat, fellowship, spend time with uh, publicans and sinners? And uh, we looked at that last week with the two parables that the Lord gives, one on the lost sheep and the other on the lost coin. But now we want to look at the lost son in verses 11 through 32. Luke chapter 15, verse 11, it says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. It it seems to me that that's one key word that I've missed out several times as I've read through. But them, it wasn't just the, the younger son, but it was also to the elder son. He divided unto them his living. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and he took his journey into a far country, and there he wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in in want. And you never know uh, what God is going to use to draw you near unto himself. And here, uh, God used a famine. Verse 15, And he went, and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine, and he would fain to have filled his belly with the husk of the swine uh, that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? And I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Now I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. And when he was a great way off, his father saw him. And he had compassion and he ran and fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew nigh to the house he heard music and dancing. And they called one of his servants and he asked what, what these things meant. And they said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry, and he would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years do I serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gave me a kid, that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto them, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. And it was meet that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead, and is alive again, and was lost, and is found. Lord, bless the message as we get into it tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, it seems to me that we have so many blessings, and I believe if we look at the elder son, he had more blessings than what he could ever imagine and would ever really understand of what he had. And particularly as he's looking here, the father begins to address him. He says, Son, I, I was ever with thee, and all that I have was in my hand, and all you had to do was come and receive it of me. And, and I believe that uh, much of the time we, we are in much of a similar situation. We have so many so many innumerable blessings that if we would just sit down, we wouldn't be able to count them all, right? Wouldn't even be able to count half of them or even, even a tenth of them. But the Lord's been so good to us. The mercies of God are new every morning and for sure we don't deserve a single one of those blessings that God has bestowed upon us. And here, when the children of Israel would, and I'm just going to go and look at it from maybe their perspective, 
Maybe in the days when they were walking through the wilderness for 40 years, they would, have, they would have understood that God was with them all the way. And how would they know that? Well, because when they cried out, God gave them manna in the wilderness for 40 years. And as they walk, wake, wake up day by day, of course on the seventh day it wasn't there. They had to gather twice as much on Saturday, but God was faithful for 40 years to give them manna, and they would have it uh, throughout the 40 years of wandering. They had shoes on their feet, they had clothes on their back, they had this, this, this water to come from a rock, and of course the Bible tells us that rock was Jesus. And we can never forget God's presence as they would travel through that wilderness, that cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, which was evidence of God's presence that was there. And God's provision and, and God's every his 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 passionate love for the children of Israel. Though time and time again they would murmur and complain and rebel and never, but His love never changed for them. And God was ever with them. And God had plenty to give. And yet they would rebel and turn and kick against all that God had for them. And what a sad testimony. And uh, that even when God with, was with them, pride and unbelief destroyed them. The Lord reminds uh, these who are here and uh, those who Jesus addresses and was going to turn and address this parable to in that day, God had kept nothing back of His presence. He was always there. And God has kept nothing back of His provision. And of course, you and I, we, we're still enjoying that. God, God has been faithful to you and I. And He says, all that I have is thine. God has kept nothing back of His personal love for us. He, he, as He loved the elder son, He loves us too. And it would be a serious mistake for us to shut up our hearts and say, well, you know what, God has not really actually been that good to me. He's good to everybody else, but not to me. And we can't harden our hearts or darken our hearts to God's love or His mercy or His presence that He's shown us all, all the while. But it's not God who leaves us. And I look at verse 28. This elder son, when he was angry, the Bible says that he would not go in. It's not the father that separated himself from the son, but it's the son that separated himself from the father. Isn't that something? And this was a son who had everything, and he was, he was ever with the father, and he had all the provisions, and yet he had separated himself from the father, not only taking his own inheritance, his own blessing, but still being by the father's side. He distanced himself from them. And we've got to be careful of doing that. So let us flee to the Father for refuge that we might be found in Him who is full of grace and truth. The parable is broken up really into three key events. We'll look at uh, how the, the inheritance was divided, or the receiving of the inheritance, I should say, the repentance of the prodigal, and then the reasoning of the Father. So those are my three points. The repentance, or the receiving of the inheritance, repentance of the prodigal, and then the receiving of the Father. So these three events will address the context here. And uh, all of it falls in the backdrop of what I preached last week. Uh, that pharisaical spirit that was still alive and well repulsed at the fact that the Son of God would sit down and uh, break bread and eat and rejoice at the very fact that all these guys who were coming to Jesus Christ, as I mentioned last week, the, 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 maybe the maniac of Gadara if he was ever present. He would be the one that they would be repulsed at and that Jesus would spend time with them. Or maybe Mary Magdalene who the seven spirits were cast out or maybe some, some situation like that. And, and, and these guys, if they've seen Jesus sit down with somebody like that, they would be repulsed and they say, God doesn't receive that kind of person. God receives only those who are walking in obedience and doing those things. You see, they had the wrong kind of perception about who God receives. And here Jesus begins to address who really, who really God is receiving unto Himself. It's not those who, who are righteous or those who are whole that need a physician, as Jesus said. It's those who are sick. And uh, He begins to call, He shows who He, who he uh, is calling unto Himself. You know, again, the Pharisaical Spirit says that God would never associate himself with a sinner, never spend time with a sinner, never eat with a sinner, never seek a sinner or ever desire a sinner. But Jesus shows us otherwise. Jesus shows us uh, that this is not the picture that we should have of God. 
He came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost, and it was plain and simple. Last week at the parable of the sheep, we saw that God came to save the lost, the sinner, the out of the way, the down and out, the wretched, based on the merits of God's amazing grace, not of ourselves. And unless you recognize your lost condition, you can't receive it. And then we looked at the parable of the lost coin, of which the lady went and she swept the whole house, and then she found it. And then she threw a party and got excited about it. And she called all her friends and said, let's make merry. And uh, it talks about our forgiveness and how God cleans us up. So let's look here at the receiving of the inheritance. It's at the forefront of our text that many miss out on, which again, I missed out on. I pointed out to you there that the father, he, he sees that the son's not satisfied. And he asks the father to divide unto them the inheritance. And so that's what he did. He actually only asked for his own. He says, Father, give me, uh, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. He didn't ask for his brother, but he asked for his own. And he divided unto them. The father divided unto both of his sons his living. And this is what he did. And so uh, he, he was only asking for his own inheritance. He wasn't asking for to give to the other. But the younger son announced that he wanted his inheritance money. The goods that falleth to him, but it's not just the youngest son who gets his inheritance money, but the elder as well. Uh, you know, in our day and age, I guess it's not much different than what it was back then. And usually when somebody gets an inheritance, somebody's passed away, somebody's died or uh, lost their life, and uh, if you've made it into the will, and uh, you know... Uh, even if it wasn't much, but if you made it into the will, that person has passed away, that's when you got your inheritance money. And I believe that much of the same was taking place not just in our day, but back then. They didn't receive their inheritance unless somebody passed away or some situation like that. And so a lot was said about the inheritance in the Old Testament all through the book of Exodus all the way into the book of Joshua, and, and then we continue to talk about this inheritance, how it would be divided. The, the eldest son, he would get how much? He would get the double portion, right? And it would usually go to the eldest son. Once in a while we found an exception where God said the younger would serve the elder. Or I, I forget exactly how that was, but, but that was the exception, not the rule. But the, the elder got that double portion. It wasn't you know, how, how, how the divide out the inheritance that was set within the law. Even when it came to the matter of when the one father didn't have any sons, but he had like four daughters, I believe it was. And the four daughters came to Moses and said, Hey, you know, we don't, my father didn't have any sons, and we don't have any, I mean, if we don't get the inheritance, our father's land is going to be lost. So what, what are we supposed to do? And they went to Moses and said, will you please go to God and, and, and determine the matter for us? Are we still going to have an inheritance or are we not? And, and God showed them that you know, God was going to provide for them an inheritance. That, that, that land was still going to be to that particular tribe, to that particular lineage of that father. So the, how the inheritance was divided, it, it was determined there within the law, but when... Uh, it, it was there was a rare occasion when you could give out that inheritance beforehand, but it didn't happen all the time. Because why? What was you saying when you divided out the inheritance beforehand? You're pretty much saying that uh, you know you're dead unto me and I'm dead unto you. Both of there's there's a, there's a separation, and so they didn't do it beforehand. Now, this is what the, the the younger son is asking. I think it's interesting that when we get down into the text, he doesn't really say inheritance, does he? He says, divide unto me my goods, or the things that have fallen out unto me. And even when you look in the Greek text, I know you guys don't know Greek, but he doesn't use the word for inheritance there. He doesn't use uh, that long Greek word I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I don't speak Greek, okay? But uh, he doesn't use that long word. It starts with a K, kleronomia. That would be my attempt. But it doesn't use that word. He uses the other word, huizia. And it would be those goods that would fall out unto him. And so the prodigal son, he's asking for the possessions or the wealth that would be divided unto him. Essentially, there really wasn't much difference from what I could tell in studying out the text. And so when they would break it down, 
The father would still divide the land up into three parts. In two parts would go to the eldest son, and in one part would go to the youngest son. The business was divided up, the land was divided, substance was divided, all of that was divided up. And the youngest son, he would, what he would do is he would cash all of it in. He's not going to bring the sheep with him. He's not going to bring all the goods with him. He cashed it in and said, give me the cash. I want to go my way and make merry. I want to go on my long journey. I'm actually going to live for once and live it all up. And it's going to be great. He had high expectations. But yet, it's not going to bring him what he wants. And money never brings you exactly what you want. The Bible says that it makes wings like a dove and it just takes off and flies away. And it's true. And by, uh, there's a proverbial saying, I guess it is. It says, a fool and his money or what? Soon parted. That's what takes place here, isn't it? His father begins to divide unto the older son. He says, here's your, your two lots. Here's your double portion that's, that's been designed for you. You're going to be the one, you know, if you still stick around, you're going to be the one who's going to take over the business, the family farm. You're going to be the one who's going to carry on the family name. You're going to be the one who's going to keep our lot here in this land. Here is your portion, and here's your, young, your, your younger brother. Here's his portion, a third. And he gives, again, cashes in the money, and it begins to go off and run away. As far as he can get away from the Father, far and far and far away as he can possibly go, never looking back, breaking the Father's heart. Just like that sheep that went astray. And would have been a bold move again. He's telling the family, he says, I'm dead unto you. I'm not looking back. I'm playing in my own way. I'm doing it my way. And that's a dangerous saying. He thinks he's going to find satisfaction, but what he's going to find is heartbreak. But he receives his portion, and uh, by chance, he might be able to return home, but that, that, that remained to be seen at this point in time. Of course, we know the outcome. But the repentance of the prodigal. The attention's now turned to the prodigal. Jesus moves on to show us what makes prodigal so special to the heart of the Father. It's, it's not the fact that the son went away. You know, that, that would cause sorrow. And of course, you know, if any of my sons got older and they rebelled and they, they decided to depart from me, you know, that's going to break my heart. I believe it broke the father's heart. That's not what touches his heart. You know, when, when it comes to him wasting all his father's goods that he had worked hard for, he's not very happy about that. He's not excited about that. He's not thrilled that his father or that his son went and wasted everything that he had worked hard for and provided this land, this land that was part of the family name all along. He's not excited about that. He's not thrilled about the suffering that the son's going to go through and how he's going to wind up in a place of disgrace and a pigsty. He's, he's a, probably appalled by the fact that all of this is going on. But there is a part that brings satisfaction to the father, and we'll see this in just a bit. As the son, he takes his journey. This money that his father's worked so very hard for, he begins to blow it. And it gets wasted very fast. We all know that it takes a lot longer to make money than to spend it, right, Brother Tommy? You work years and years and years and years, and next thing you know, your money just goes up in smoke. It doesn't take very much for money to be gone. I mean, you pour in your blood, sweat, and tears, and next thing you know, it just makes wings and flies away. But we all know that it takes a lot longer to make it than to spend it. But this young man and his money was soon parted, and the money was gone. And when your money's gone, guess what? You know, he, he could go out and make all these friends and spend it with whatever or whoever that he wants to. But you know, if he's in the beer joint, you know, everybody's excited when he's there providing for the rounds, but when the money's gone, he doesn't have any friends anymore. When he's going out and he's, he's just luxuriously just throwing his money away, he has friends while the money's there, but when the money's gone, his friends are gone. And he gets to the point where he realizes he's in a bad situation. And the prodigal son... I'm sure that he remembers his father at this point in time. He's, yeah, I know dad's probably waiting for me to humble myself and come on back home. 
He's probably there at the edge of the fence waiting for me. I'm not going to do it though. Pride got a hold of his heart. I'm sure that he, he probably thought to himself, well, I'm out of money. The next best thing that I could do is probably go and look for a job and maybe make a, so fill out some applications and knock on some doors and maybe somebody will hire me. After all, I've spent all this money. They're, they'll, they'll take care of me. But it didn't. He goes knocking and nobody's giving him a job. He goes searching and none of his friends will welcome him in. He goes looking and there's nobody that's going to welcome him except for there's one citizen of the country who he says that he went to join himself to, but I don't believe he joined himself to that citizen. He joined himself to the pigs, is what the Bible tells me. And as we're sitting here, we're looking at the prodigal and he's come to the end of himself and he realizes that, that you know, he just, the pigs are eating better than he is. He would fain fill his belly with the husks. He feels like he's ready to perish with hunger. He gets to thinking to himself. He says, man, daddy's servants. Not just, the, the, you know, they had three different sorts of servants back in that day. They had the bond servant, the man who would work a certain period of time, then the debts were forgiven, and then the bond servant would be the one where if he loved his master enough, he would go and declare before all the judges and say, oh, I, I love my master so much, I, I don't want to leave and I'll serve him for the rest of my life. And they would bring forth the judges, make a declaration and say, well, I'm going to serve this guy. And he would stand up against the door, remember in, in the book of Exodus, and it, that master would take that all and nail a hole through his ear. And he says, mine ear has out opened. In Psalm chapter 40, speaking of the Messiah, mine ear has out opened. An obedient servant, who just loves, he's excited to do the will of his father, whatever, whatever that may be, and he's determined for the rest of his life, along with whatever rights or privileges he may have, because, I mean, he, he was probably a higher up sort of, he was the highest sort of servant that you can get, a bond servant. That's what the Apostle Paul calls himself, right? Just a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he had a regular servant. He's the next man under the uh, the one under who's, who's still overseen. He has a little bit of responsibility, but not much. And then you had a hired servant who was the lowest of the low that you could possibly go. And this young prodigal looks, is thinking to himself, he says, man, is it these hired servants, I mean the one who is just like in Jesus' day, that nobody would stoop down and girdle on a cloth and, and clean somebody's feet because that's for the lowest of the lowest of the lowest that you could possibly go, those hired servants. This is the one who the prodigal son says, I'm willing to be that for my father. I'm willing to do the most humiliating job. These guys have bread enough to eat. I don't have anything. These guys are obviously loved by my father. I don't have anything. These guys have been given so much they, they enjoy being taken care of. My, they, they are beneficiaries of my father's hard work and yet they have so much more and I'm sitting here suffering. And he's come to the end of himself. And so many are waiting for their prodigals to come to the end of themselves. I know some people like that. They're just like, just still in defiance and saying, oh, I can still do it on my own until they come like this prodigal who turns his pigsty into an altar and gets down on his knees and said, I had enough. He remembers the goodness of his father. He still believes in the love of his father for his son. Uh, I mean, he, he is just, his heart yearns to get back to home. That's what this prodigal is at. So he gets down and he forms a plan. He begins to form a plan of returning. He says, I want to go and I, I want to return. Uh, verse 18, he says, I will arise. This is his plan. I will arise and go to my father. He's, in other words, this would be a picture of a sinner who would turn in repentance from his He would go and turn toward God and away from Him everything that he was living for in the past. Turn from the pigsty, turn from his friends, turn from his riotous living, turn from that lifestyle and turn to God. This is what he's doing. He says, I'm, 
going to go and return to my father. This is I go to my father. And I would say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. That's the words of repentance there. He recognizes that he didn't just sin against his father, but he sinned against God and his earthly father. And then verse 19, he says, I'm no more worthy to be called thy servant. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Make me as one of those who washes the feet, who does the hard work, who's not guaranteed anything. The Father's a great man. He wants his son back, I'm sure. As he's traveling back, probably with his tail tucked between his legs, in humility, trying to return back to the Father and probably recounting everything, making sure that He's got everything, uh, just rehearsing what His plan is. This man, those hired servants got everything. And the Father sitting there from His position of holiness, that's how we win somebody. The Father never goes and lowers His standards to keep His Son, did He? <laughs> never says, well, I'll, Son, I'll, I'll just... Lower my standards, I'll lower my expectations, I'll lower my whatever the case may be in order to keep him. He never does that. But he just waits for his son to return. Just like Abraham is, he's waiting for Lot. Abraham, though he had to rescue Lot time and time again, never lowered his standards to bring Lot back unto himself. But he prayed for him. And he looked for him. He listened for him. And he interceded for him. And as the son makes his way back to the father, he begins to uh, rehearse all these words. And just as he sees the father, the father sees him first and he comes running to embrace this prodigal son, knowing everything that he's ever done. He never asked for a word of, of, of an excuse. You know, all of us are quick to give an excuse. You know, well, this is the reason why I did it, because you were so hard on me, Dad. Now, this is the reason why you know, he doesn't wait for an excuse. He comes and embraces him with full love. He's, he's not waiting for an excuse. He's not waiting for him to make things right. He's not waiting for him to prove himself. He's not waiting for him to do something in order for him to come back into the family. And he's showing us a picture of what salvation really is because if he has to work to gain the Father's favor, then what is that telling us about salvation? You have to work for it, right? And if you have to prove yourself in order to come into the family, then that shows us that you have to work or you have to do something in order to be saved. And this is what Jesus is trying to get across to that elder son, the Pharisees. God's grace is free. He sees the true repentance upon his heart. He says, Father, he comes out and says it to him verbally, openly. Father, yeah, I know, I recognize that I have sinned. I've blown all of your money. I, I've come to this lowest point in my life. I know I smell like hogs because that's where I come from. I don't have anything but the clothes upon my back and I'm hoping you receive me as I am without any money or without anything or without any excuse. But here I am. And I repent, and, and, and Father, I've sinned against you, and will you please just make me as one of your higher servants? But what does the Father do? He shows them what salvation's all about. He shows them true love. He shows them mercy, and He shows them grace, and He shows them everything that you and I love about the Savior, because that's how we come to Him. The Father goes to Him, and He tells a servant who's close by, as he's still weeping and kissing the son upon the neck. He says, I want you to go and get me the robe. You know, that, that nice robe, my robe. I want you to take that robe and put it here on the son. I don't know about you, but when you think about a robe, what do robes go to? Uh, when I think about a robe, you know, besides just a superhero, but it's on kings. Kings wear robes. Princes wear robes. People who are higher up and have a high position as a position of honor, they have the robes. And here the, the, the father says, I want to clothe my son with the highest honor because I'm receiving him back as my own. 
cleanse of all that filthiness and everything that he's been recognized by. Clothing him with my own goodness. Puts a ring on his hand. You know, all this land that he lost and all the substance that he lost and everything else that he lost. The Father says, restore him full and free. Give him my ring with the authority. Give him everything that he's lost. Give it back to him. Put shoes on his feet. And sometimes you and I, we fail to recognize how significant the shoes are. You know, you, you look at somebody, if they have Nike Airs on, usually that's a sig- signal that they, they play basketball or sports or something like that. that I, I don't wear Nikes. I'm not athletic. I don't wear sports or p- play sports. You see somebody who wears Oxfords, what do you think? Sore feet. feet, yeah. Probably a businessman, a politician, a preacher, somewhere along those lines. You see somebody who wears loafers. You know, shoes you have identify you by something, right? Not everybody had shoes back in those days. I can't imagine what it's like. I have a hard time. I remember when I lived up in Pennsylvania and uh, I went without shoes and trying to walk across those gravel rocks and my feet killing me. And I said, never again. Back in those days, the slaves didn't have the, the sandals. They didn't have the shoes. Those were for the sons. Those were for the higher ups. Those were for people who had status. Shoes demonstrated a lot of things, power, possessions, inheritance, that, those kind of things. When, when Ruth, she, she is going, she's looking, she understands that Boaz is her kinsman redeemer. What happens there when, when Boaz says, I want to go and fix this matter today? And Boaz goes, talks to the next of kin, the kinsman redeemer, and begins to tell her, he said, by the moment that you accept everything that's Naomi's, you also accept what is Ruth's, and Ruth is a Gentile and she's come into the land. And he said, no, no, I don't want to mar my possessions. I don't want to mar my name or anything else. Boaz, you can have. You can have this. You can have Naomi, all that's Naomi's and all that's Ruth. You can have what's Malon's and Chilean's. You can have all of this. And what does he do there in that ceremony? That next of kin has to take off the shoe. And plucks it off. And gives it over to Boaz. And it symbolizes what was once his now belongs to Boaz. It's his possession. It's his inheritance. It's his privilege to take it if he wants it. When the children of Israel were coming into the promised land, the Bible tells us Joshua, I believe it is, let me get down here to it. I have the verse written down, Joshua 14.9. says, And Moses swear in that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy foot feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. I remember when God told Abraham, and He says, Look as far as you can to the east, west. I mean, look anywhere that you can. I'm going to give you this place wherever the soles of your feet touch. That is going to be yours. This is essentially what... God tells Moses and what Moses tells Joshua, and then they go out and inherit the land. Wherever your feet touch, that's yours. That's yours. Begins to talk about how he's being brought back into his possession and his power and his privilege. Then they celebrated and killed the fatty calf. Why? Because the son has passed from a place where he was dead. Dead to the family. Dead to whatever rights that he may have had. And pass unto life. That's what the Bible says about us once we get saved. We pass from death unto life. That's what it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2. We pass from death unto life. And this is whom God receives. Remember our parable? He says, this man receiveth sinners. Yeah, why? Because this man repented and he came back unto the Father and he showed him his grace and showed him his love, showed him his forgiveness, showed him what salvation is really about. 
Now we find the thrust of the story coming to the forefront, the reasoning of the father as he comes and he addresses this eldest son. And watch the reaction to the father. Here's the eldest son is coming. He's coming from the field, is he not? From a hard day of working. And next thing you know, he hears the music. He sees the dancing. He hears all this commotion going on in the house. And he calls one of the servants unto himself. And he says, what is going on here? Why is my father rejoicing? Why was I not invited to this? And the servant begins to address the eldest son, and he tells the, the eldest son, he says, Yeah, uh, you're, you, you remember your younger brother? You know, the one that has wasted everything? You know, the one who was involved in riotous living? You know, the one who was ashamed to the family? You know, the one who spoiled all of his goods? You want to know the one who caused suffering and pain to the family? That son. That son has come back. And your father has received them and put the robe and the ring and the shoes and killed the fatty calf for them and they're in the house rejoicing. And what does that eldest son do? The Bible says he got angry. And he would not come in. His attitude was in brazen defiance. He said, I'm not stepping foot in that house as long as my brother's there. I'm not coming to talk to my dad. He's going to come out and talk to me. I'm not going to have anything to do with what's going on there in that house. They're going to come to me. That brazen defiance that he has there. And as his father comes out and he begins to plead with the elder son and, and explain to him, he says, we, we, we ought to rejoice your, father, your, your, your younger son. He's alive and there's repentance and he's a new creature and he's, he's been transformed and he's been remade by the renewing of his mind and, and we're here rejoicing because of this great hour of the day and you ought to rejoice with us and the son's not having anything to do with it. He begins to talk to the father in such a, this brazen tone. And he says, Father, do you not know how many years? All these years, he says. All these years that I have served. And the word that he uses is a word like a slave. I served you like a slave. I've worked hard for the things that I enjoy. Look at everything that I've done for you. You've benefited from me. That's his attitude. And so the brazen uh, attitude that he has, the boldness from, 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 from picturing the father like some sort of taskmaster or something that he has to, to serve with rigor and hardship and service. And even taking it a step further. And he says, not once. Your son out here, he, he got involved in that riotous living against your will. But not once have I transgressed your commandment. Your son out here, he has completely humiliated the family. Not once have I ever thought or ever dreamed or ever hoped to be involved in what that guy has done. Not once. Have I transgressed against thy commandment? He shows them the brazen attitude. He shows them the bondage that he believes he's in, the bitter bondage, and then he boasts of everything about our, his achievements. And what does Paul say? He says, we have nothing to boast of. The only glory we have to do is to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ and dying for our sins. It's the same sort of boast that the rich, rich young ruler boasted of. He says, yeah, I've kept all these commandments since my birth. Yeah, but you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have. His brazen attitude, his bitter bondage, and the boast of his achievements. And you know what this shows us? It shows us the view of his father. He judged his father as somebody who was unjust. He essentially says, in effect, look who you're letting in this house. God, you're unjust by loving somebody who is a sinner, a transgressor against your commandment. You are unjust by your attitude toward a sinner as opposed to your attitude toward me. Essentially, Jesus is showing the Pharisees, you're accusing God of injustice because He welcomes the sinner who repents and comes to the Father. 
and is blessed by the Father and you're bitter because of it. You think God is unjust. He says you accuse God of being unfair. That you, you love this guy more than you love me. But the truth of the matter is, the Father says, I'm always with you. And all that I have is thine. He accuses him of being unjust and unfair because the son thinks that he deserves it and the eldest does, or the youngest does not. And um, he also accuses him of being a taskmaster. Look at how I served you all these years. I know people like that. I've served you all these years and I deserve more and I deserve this and I deserve that very self-focused sort of attitude. The, th- the father was ever there. But the elder son, we noticed, but he never came to the father. He said, I was always with you. But he never came. I believe he still had a robe for the elder son, a ring, some shoes for the elder son, but he never came to receive them. The elder son had greater privileges, but he wasted them. The elder son had greater opportunities, but he refused them. And here is the Savior's plea to the elder son, Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. A missionary once told this very same story to a man on a foreign soil, and he began to explain to him about the prodigal son. He laid it all out and told the man, he says, Do you understand what I'm telling you? He said, I think so. He says, Will you please tell me? Tell me what this story means to you. He says, well, he says, as you tell me, related this story to me, he says, it sounds to me like a master. He's traveling on by and he has two robes and he hands two robes to two different people. And one person, he's rich and he has everything and, and he doesn't think that he needs it because he's attended church and he has all these righteous works and he's done this and he's done that and and, and he thinks that his robes are much better than what the Master has. Me, a poor sinner. The Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous that's ever lived, went to that cross and He clothed me with His righteousness. I recognized that I was without any clothing or without anything to give or without anything to offer. I recognized that everything that I'd done was in wickedness against God. And I gladly received that robe. And said to the other man, he's so rich that he doesn't become poor in spirit, doesn't see his need, and he refuses the Father's goods. He said, would you please, please plead with those who are like that Laodicean church, who boast of their riches and know not that they're poor, wretched, destitute, and wicked. The one whom Jesus says, I counsel thee to buy me gold. I wonder how many have said to themselves, Lord, I've served thee these many years. Lord, I've kept thy commandments. Lord, if anybody's worthy, I'm worthy. And I wonder how many talk with an air of superiority, a holier than now, and have never taken Christ's free gift of salvation. Don't you think that the father had plenty of robes that he could clothe the elder son? He could have received any son that came to him. He could have had plenty of shoes for their feet. He had a ring for all of his children. But they wouldn't receive it. And that's the way it is. I mean, you go out and you knock on the doors, you try to tell people about Jesus Christ. And say that there's room enough for you. God will clothe you with His righteousness. He'll seal you with the Holy Spirit of promise. I mean, He'll shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel. And you can serve Him in His power. And you'll have the best days of your life. Hardships, of course. Heartbreaks, of course. There's no better place to be than in the arms of Jesus knowing what He's forgiven us of. You know, it's just taking me a whole different direction because I've never really seen it in that light how the the elder son perceived the Savior, perceived God as being unjust and unfair and being a taskmaster. God forbid that be us to accuse God of such a thing. Let us reach people and tell them about the Savior.
Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray you would just use this message. Lord, drive it home in our hearts how thankful we, we ought to be that you have clothed us with your righteousness. Lord, you have given us your Holy Spirit. Lord, you've given us gifts among men whereby we might serve you acceptably. And Lord, we've been given everything. As I recall, just as I started out the sermon, there are those Israelites who would walk through the wilderness for 40 years and see the manna on every hand, a rock and the pillar of fire. And many of them took that for granted and still lived in unbelief and perished in the wilderness. Lord, help us to realize that you're ever there. You've never moved. And you're still waiting to receive sinners. Help us to be busy about our Father's business and seeing souls saved. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.